Hello, welcome to the Monday, August 29th, 2022 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. This weekend, we had a number of nice Internet Storm Center diary posts. So let's start with one by Didier showing how to deal with false positives when scanning memory dumps for Cobalt Strike Beacons. To do so, Didier updated his 1768.py tool. This tool typically searches for the beacon information in memory dumps by looking for the header. But well, that particular pattern may show up in unrelated memory segments, and that of course gets you then false positives. A new option to the tool will now apply additional sanity checks, removing the false positives from the output. Now, the sanity checks that they introduced uh, will check if the payload type and the public key values are reasonable because whatever numbers come back for payload type that this is one that's uh, actually uh, being uh, used one cause of these false positives is also that antivirus signatures will sometimes contain uh, those patterns of course they're also looking uh, for those patterns and uh, that sort of is how they end up in memory an additional uh, feature that uh, the 1768.py tool has is to offer a verbose mode. With the verbose mode, you'll sort of get a little memory dump basically around the area where the signature was matched. And in the case of uh, antivirus tools, you often then see strings indicating essentially the malware signature, the malware name that is then uh, being associated with that signature. So that usually gives you a good idea that you're dealing here with signatures, not with the actual malware. And Guy on Saturday took a look at HTTP2, similar to uh, seeing TLS requests to non-TLS servers. If you have an HTTP2 request hitting a server that doesn't actually understand HTTP2, you sort of get a cryptic hexadecimal data in your log. The HTTP method that's being used here is then often PRI, P-R-I, it's short for prior knowledge. It's meant to connect via HTTP2 directly. Now, for normal servers and clients, HTTP2 is pretty much exclusively used over TLS, and then the ALPN, the application layer protocol negotiation, is used during the TLS handshake to figure out if the server supports HTTP2. This prime method is of a little bit of a shortcut, often just used to also scan for servers that are supporting HTTP2 without sort of going through the TLS handshake. Wireshark luckily does a pretty good job in analyzing HTTP2. So if you do have PCAPs, then that is pretty straightforward. If you don't have PCAPs, well, of course, you can always map the hexadecimal uh, output that you see in your logs to the HTTP2 data. And what better for an attacker than attempting to fish two different sites in one simple email? The email itself uh, just contains a simple JPEG image, and it's one of those uh, fake uh, PayPal invoices. In this case, well, it claims that it charged you a few hundred dollars for uh, the cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase, so suggesting that maybe you bought some cryptocurrencies. The email actually does not contain a link. Instead, the victim is just asked to call a phone number and, well, lucky or sadly, depending on how you look at it, uh, looks like that phone number was already reported. Xavier was uh, not able to actually reach someone at that phone number. But of course, now they could go after PayPal and uh, Coinbase passwords or credentials. So uh, that could be specifically uh, dangerous. And since internals released a new version of Sysmon, now uh, version 14 gives you a new event ID, 27. This event ID is uh, pretty interesting. It's triggered whenever the system was blocked from writing an executable to disk. So with Sysmon now you block a writing of the executable, but then you also get this alert. So you will see it in your logs. You'll be able to collect uh, these alerts. 
Writing an actual to disk may either happen, of course, when you download it, it's probably the more likely uh, th thing here, or also if software is compiled on the host itself, which of course could be used to bypass some uh, scanning on the network. Sounds like a real great rule, particularly for sort of normal office machines. And don't enable it for your developers and probably also for sort of some system administrators. You may get some false positives there. And the Web3 domain eth.link uh, has an issue in that it will likely be open open for re-registration on September 5th. Apparently, it wasn't uh, renewed on July 26th. GoDaddy is currently the registry registrar holding it. The owner of the domain, well, is in jail. ETH.link is important because it's used by the Ethereum name service protocol, a decentralized autonomous organization. Not having to tell you how ironic it is that for a decentralized autonomous organization, one individual being in jail causes big problems. ETH.link is behind those .eth domains that you may have seen that sort of uh, popular in the Ethereum uh, community. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.